we have one final uh, talk uh, this morning. And uh, so up to now, we've been hearing a lot about uh, policy and uh, science uh, towards the public good. And, and one voice that we haven't heard uh, so much yet is the role of the press in this whole uh, process. And so we have uh, a, a wonderful speaker coming now to tell us what I hope would be a little bit of information about that. David Hassemeyer is uh, a journalist, uh, investigative journalist from the Inside Climate, Climate News, a publication that many of us uh, are very familiar with. Uh, he's the co-author of the, uh, the Dilbit disaster, Inside the Biggest Oil Spill You've Never Heard Of. And, and I have to say, I'd never heard of it either. So, uh, and that, that uh, series of articles uh, won the 2013 Pulitzer Prize uh, in, in, for national reporting. Uh, he's also part of the Inside Climate News uh, team that's won several other awards, and rather than me spending a great deal of time talking about all his uh, awards, I think we'd all much rather hear uh, what he has to say. So welcome, uh, David. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and just want to say thank you to you guys for the work that you're doing, because it is so vitally important to not only our region, our state, our country, but to this world. And it's, it's really important. And it's important that you be able to communicate that and why it's important to the, the everyday populace. When, when I was asked to do this, I, uh, I was trying to think of how do, I, how do I introduce kind of the topic um, do I try to set it in the contemporary and, you know, talk about this new administration, talk about Lamar Smith and his science committee and making the EPA great again? Uh, do I talk about um, the, 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 the assault on NASA and NOAA? Um, or do I try to relate to you guys on methane research, CO2 studies, or even, you know, uh, why we're here, the CFCs? I thought, no, you know what? I want to tell you about Lynn Buring. Let me tell you a little bit about Lynn Buring. Lynn Buring is a 68-year-old retired school teacher living in central Texas. She retired to a, a place near Carn City, Texas with her husband in about 2002. The idea was that Lynn and her husband, Shelby, would have a nice retirement where they could sit on their porch in the evenings, watch the sunset, listen to the crickets. A few years after moving to their little ranch-style home, a tremendous uh, gas field, an oil field, was discovered in, the, in their region. It was called the Eagle Ford. It turned out that it is one of the largest natural gas and oil um, fields in the, the United States now. Within a few years, uh, the fracking companies moved in and, and brought with them the, uh, the flares, brought with them the processing plants. And along with that, the air quality diminished dramatically. So that Lynn Buring and her husband were no longer able to sit out on their patio in the evening, watch the sunset because the emissions were so overpowering that they were forced to, to stay inside. Their health deteriorated. And, and our research showed, and, and our research focused on, on permits issued by the Texas uh, Commission on Environmental Quality on a few uh, University of Texas air quality studies. And we found that within a one mile radius of the Buring residence, and, and this is one, one mile in an oil field about the size of Rhode Island. We found the amount of VOCs being emitted. Were, they, were, they were about 200 tons of VOCs being emitted within just a mile of, of her home. And it, it's through the science that you, we, we understand the harmful effect on the environment and on people. 
So it was through Lynn Buring that we were able to tell the story of the consequences of the VOCs and of the fracking. And what we tried to do is take something that was really complicated and we tried to humanize it through Lynn Buring's eyes and through how it has changed her life, how it's changed the lives of her neighbors and the, the potential consequences to it to the region. Um, and, and so that's, that's the challenge that a journalist faces and that is truly a challenge and I would say an obligation for the scientists. It's, it's now more important than ever that you be able to communicate your science and the consequences of what you're finding. In other words, you, you have to think, how is this important and why is this important to people outside of a group like this? What are the consequences to, to the humans, to, uh, to life on this planet? And, you know, and I, I think at this point in history, I, I mean, this immediate point where, where we now circle back to this administration, that is attacking the science. And the ripple effect to that attack is the consequences on everyone on this planet. Um, and so s science is now becoming more crucial than ever to America and, and to the world. And what, what journalists, and, and I, I am just kind of your everyday journalist. I, I am not a scientist. I don't have a science background. But I understand why things are important. And, and we, we share a kind of a, a dual challenge. My challenge is to be able to reach out to you folks and ask you to help me tell people why your work is so important. And it's, it's, it's kind of, it's daunting, and it's daunting for you, it's daunting for me. In fact, yesterday when I, I came here and I saw this, I'm thinking, oh my. You know, I, I have a, a general understanding of what this means, but I have to be able to take this and communicate it to the average person. Why, why an ozone hole is important and how the, the, the catastrophic, the potential catastrophic consequences of, of this. I can't, I can't do that alone. I need your help. And, and, I need, and I need your help to help me understand why these things are important. I need you to help me understand the science, so I need you to be patient with me. And, and, and I hope as, as you leave here that you, you think about this in the sense of communicating to the public why it's important as much as, almost as much as it is doing the, the science and the research itself. Because in and of itself, you know, you, you want to, to, to make a difference with your science. I want to make a difference with my journalism. You want to make a difference with your science. So you need to start thinking about how you can make a difference with your science. Um, and, and, it's, and, it, and, it's, and, I, and I heard a little bit yesterday how, how Sherry Rowland um, became really an advocate, and he, and he began pushing public policy. And, and that's what's so vitally important now. Um, and and I, I suggest that everyone here has that opportunity to use the media, to use whatever public forum you have as your bully pulpit. In, uh, in the early 1900s, when Teddy Roosevelt was experiencing reluctance from Congress to take on the monopolies, experienced reluctance to regulate food and drug and labor issues. He decided to bypass Congress and, and that whole mess, and, and he took his arguments to the public, and he got the, the public behind him. And that's, that's what scientists, I think, need to do, um, is, is get that groundswell of public support so that when your representatives have their town hall meetings, um, people are holding up the red cards, and, and, it's, and it's obviously important for healthcare, but it's equally important for climate. So 
through, through our work um, in trying to, to communicate that, um, we, uh, we need um, that kind of uh, a, a, the, the symbiotic relationship where I want you to trust me, I want you to trust journalists that we want to make a difference with your work. Um, when, uh, whenever I uh, first approach uh, a researcher or a scientist, one of the first things I do, I don't, I don't try to launch into to their research, I talk to them about who they are. Where did they come from? Why are you interested in doing this? Um, I did a story, a story on, on, on Arctic beetles and climate change. And I think the, the researcher thought, well, he actually asked if, if I was one of those cuckoos, because he didn't know who I was. Because I, I, I was asking him things like, so tell me what it's like to just crawl around for hours and hours looking for these beetles. You know, I, I don't want to hear about your research yet. I just want, what motivates you to be on hands and knees looking for these beetles? And so he told me that story. And we, we, we developed a relationship that way. But that, that, was a, that allowed me a vehicle so that he was comfortable with me, and it allowed me the vehicle to be able to tell that story and to explain why the changing uh, lifestyles of Arctic beetles was important in understanding one small piece of climate change. Um, and as, as we go through this, um, I, li I like to try to make these interactive. So at, at any point, if, if, uh, if you have questions, uh, please um, interrupt, uh, let, me, let me know. Um, you guys have the job of making these great discoveries. Um, we have the, the job of communicating those discoveries. And one of the things that a journalist can do that maybe the scientists and researchers can't do as effectively is I'm the guy who can hound Scott Pruitt. I'm the guy who can show up at Scott Pruitt's press conferences and ask the tough questions. He may not, he may not want to answer them, but at least I, I can put them out there. So I need, I need your help so that I can understand the issues, so that I can better ask the questions that, you know, it, it's on all of your minds, but I have that access, and I can do it, and you know what? I like doing it. I, I, I like making people like Scott Pruitt feel uncomfortable <laughs> because they, they, have, they have an obligation to explain. Um, so at, at that point, if, if there are questions. I think earlier on you said something about uh, um, 200 tons of VOCs that were near this, these people's homes. Is that 200 tons like a day being given that, No, that's, that's annual. Um, and, and I think it's why I wanted to use that to illustrate. It, it was coming from just three point sources. When we found out that within this region, there were probably close to 6,000 point sources. But what, what we, why we use that is we wanted, to, we wanted people to begin empathizing with Lynn Buring. And once, once you have somebody who can empathize with, with somebody like Lynn Buring and what she is suffering because of these emissions, then you can transition into kind of the larger science issue. And the, the name of the series is Big Oil, Bad Air. And it's, it, if, if you look it up, you'll, you'll kind of see how we use Lynn Buring as that vehicle to get into it. And then we transition into the, the interpretation of, of the science behind it. And I really enjoyed your comment, comments, David. So, um, you know, over the years, especially probably the last decade, my sense is that the number of investigative journalists has dropped dramatically. Uh, I may be wrong on that. So, so a question, so for example, you know, a lot of the print newspapers are throwing away the dodo bird, right? Uh, so, um, it, and Inside Climate News is, is wonderful and is, you know, going forward in, in terms of online and so on. Uh, what's your sense about um, the, uh, how many investigative journalists 
are coming along, and is that pool shrinking or growing or steady state? You know, I, I, you know it, it, it has shrunk dramatically, um, but I, I think it's, it's rebounding now, and I, and I, but, oh yeah, ab absolutely. Um, you know, we, we always used to use the example that um, about four years ago, the New York Times disbanded its science team, disbanded its environmental team. But now they're bringing them back. The Washington Post is bringing them back. So it's, it's rebounding um, now. Uh, and and I, I think it's, it's rebounding because we, we obviously understand why, uh, why this kind of work is so important. I'm not familiar with that particular piece, but I know from my perspective and the perspective of, of Inside Climate News, we, as, as journalists, and we, we are a, a news organization where we, we, don't have a, we don't have a bias. Obviously, we are, we are addressing the climate issues and climate change, but we're doing it in a way that we hope brings more depth and breadth to the issue without being an advocacy organization. Now, with that being said, we recognize the outliers, and we don't give them the weight. And, and I think you're, you're going to find that as there is more and more work, journalistic work done on, on climate, that these outliers will be given less and less weight. Um, what, uh, what, what we ask of you is to be patient with us and to you know work with us and and not feel that we are going to have a bias not feel that we are going to be using these outliers um you know as as the counterpoint all of the time um it's it is frankly a a a tenet of, of journalism in in fairness um that if there is a legitimate other side we need to present that, and, and we will, and we'll continue to do that. Um, but as as mainstream media, we we won't um, give extra weight to to those kind of outliers. So I'd like to ask you to explore. You know that I, I think one one of the the most powerful pictures, and I, and I say that because I took the picture, um, <laughs> is I uh, 
I was talking with a, uh, a, a family, um, who, uh, a woman who had her grandchildren with her. And within, oh, probably 100 yards of their backyard of the swing set where her six-year-old and eight-year-old grandkids played in the afternoon, there was a processing plant with multiple flares. And, and I remember, as I was talking to the grandmother, the grand, grandkids walked up to her, grabbed her hands, and they started walking through this field. And I just, I took a step back, and I took this photograph that shows the grandmother hand in hand with these two children and these multiple flares behind them. So it, it, it is, it, it's, it's very powerful, it is very visceral. In fact, please, I read, read our piece, because we, we describe how Lynn Buring is coming back from one of her doctor's appointments. Uh, a little back, she was asthmatic, so it exasperated her, uh, her asthma. So we describe how Lynn Buring is, is returning to this rural part in Texas uh, from San Antonio, where she had, had seen her doctor. And she, she keeps, an, keeps an inhaler on the seat be, beside her because as, as she leaves San Antonio on the drive south to her home, we describe not only the, the trees, the pecan trees, and this sort of thing, we start describing the, the wells and the frac sites, uh, because it is, it is part of that scene. Um, and again, that's, that's how we as journalists try to drive the message home, is by setting that kind of scene. Because in, in our first few paragraphs, you know, we don't get into the science, we don't belabor the point with 189 tons of benzene, methane, this sort of thing. It would lose people. So it, it is, it's very powerful to do it that way, and, and we do it. Um, and, those, and, and those are the things that when, when a, a journalist comes to you and starts to ask you about your research, if you have those kind of visceral scenes that you can paint for us, that's a big help. Can you comment on the emergence of new media and how that's changing the landscape for telling the story? You know, it's, it's interesting because you're, you're, you're talking to an old dog here, a real old dog, <laughs> who, uh, who, who started his, his career writing stories on a selectric typewriter. Um, and and I, I, am, I am still probably one of those on the fringes who hasn't really come to fully put my arms around that new media because I always tell people, you know, I don't think you can blog and tweet powerful, impactful journalism. Now, that being said, you know, we certainly have to recognize the, uh, the power of, uh, of that media. And we, uh, we are working on our presentations to adapt it to that kind of media. And now I, I kind of joke that if, uh, if I do a, a series of stories on Exxon and you know, its, its emissions and its science from the 1980s, how do we present that in kind of the multimedia form? Uh, we, uh, we start by writing a long form story, then we take that long form story and we condense it to a short form story, then we work on how we're gonna blog it how we're going to tweet it. And, and I suggest that, and I, I'm starting to, to understand why it's important, but it's like you almost start trying to think outside of the box, and, and you almost think, okay, if we're doing this, then maybe how do we set this to wrap? How do we, you know, just, cause you're right, we've got we've to get this message across somehow. I can mean, just really quick, sorry to interrupt, but if you look at Al, Al Gore's Our Choice book, it's a really beautiful way. It's only available on Apple, but it's a beautiful way that it blends the multimedia into a really nice piece, yes. I think. Yeah. Okay, we have time for two more questions, maybe, and then it'll be lunchtime, so we'll have a chance to talk to them before. Uh, <laughs> and 
you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not only illogical, it's, it's frightening. And, and what I'm about to tell you, you know, may, may discourage uh, our, our EPA friend here, but I have to, I have to as, as a journalist, I have to be sourced across the spectrum. So I have to be aware of what kind of the outliers are doing, because unless I understand what they're doing, you know, I can't be prepared for their arguments, I can't be prepared for how they're going to attack the mainstream science. And the, uh, the other day I, I had the opportunity, not the opportunity, but in, in the course of doing some research, I had to call um, CEI. And the, the person I talked to, to CEI just basically said, well, geez, you know, um, yeah, we're, we're no longer um, just simply deniers. Think about it. Um, there are at least 65 million people out there who, who are on our side because, after all, we elected this new administration that is cutting back the EPA, that is, is attacking science. So it's, yeah, it's, 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 really, it's really frustrating. But it's kind of like, you know, you keep your friends close and your enemies even closer. And so I think, you know, you, you can't discount that because it is an influence and, and they have a voice and they have a loud voice and that's, that's why your voices need to be heard. And so I, I, I can't address that particular thing, but I, I can address why we pay attention to those kind of people because what they are saying isn't being said in a vacuum. There are a lot of people out there who are still listening to that. And we, we have to hear that voice and we have to understand how to counter that voice and, and do it in a reasonable and rational fashion so as not to engage in hysteria with them. I, I have one last request before we dismiss for lunch. It's, it's an assignment for all of you guys. <laughs> is what I'd like you to do at lunch and just in your casual conversations, I want you to think about the presentations that, that you've made and that you've seen over the last couple of days. And I want you to think, how do you simplify that? How do you tell a story to your neighbor? How, how do you tell that story to your neighbor, Martha? You know, you get up and say, hey, how are you doing this morning? Let me tell you about this. So that's, that's what I'd like you to do, is just kind of think about how you translate this into a story.